Buongiorno, good afternoon. Um, and first of all, thank you, IGA, for having me here today. It's a pleasure to be here with you. I'm a little bit thankful for the position in the agenda after what I think is one of the most uh, profound and tough provoking speeches that I heard in a long time, the one of Liz Jackson. And it was not for me just a speech on design for inclusivity or disability design, but I think it's a speech on design, and that's all. And so thanks, Liz, for reminding to all of us how we need to think as designers. Less grateful also because on top of it, Chris and I are the one dividing you 1,500 creatives from drinks and, and celebrations tonight. But anyway, let's jump into it. Um, why the world needs design more than ever? By the way, also the business world. But before anything else, why the world needs design more than ever? Well, simply because we live in a world that is rapidly changing and an acceleration and a speed never experienced before. There are a variety of different drivers of this change. This is a list of some of those drivers uh, that looking back at the work I did in many of these big corporations and small enterprises in the past years, uh, were somehow the, the major uh, trends, the major drivers of the reason why uh, they were these companies, big and small, were embracing design. Uh, before anything else, the, the, the role of internet. Essentially, internet like, uh, creates what I like to define as global accessibility to knowledge. When you know that when you want to know something, when you have any question, you can find your answer taking out this device, your phone, and Googling your answer. I remember when I was a kid, when I had any kind of question, if my parents couldn't answer those questions, I had to take a bus, go to the library, hope that the library was open, I could find eventually the right book to give me the answers, and maybe I was going to have the answers. Therefore, the most of the times, I was ending up without answers. This is creating a world where the people we talk to, the consumers, the customers, the users, the people, I like to call them people, uh, they are savvier, smarter, more connected, they are very informed, and there is no way to fool them in any possible uh, manner. The global market is creating what I like to call global accessibility to purchase. Uh, essentially, you can get access to anything you want, anytime you want. Uh, you still go eventually to a store to experience the product, to talk with the customer service, to really understand if that kind of product is what you want. But then if there is not the exact model that you search, or if there is not the kind of product that you search in your trip to the grocery store, for instance, you can still, once again, take out this device and order whatever you want online. Mostly, the most of the time, this is driven by convenience. It could be the convenience of shipping it home, it could be the convenience of a better price, or it could be the convenience of finding the specific variation of model, the specific color, the specific finish uh, that you don't find in the store. It's very interesting as designers, this new challenge that we have in front of us of mixing digital and physical, of understanding how to create the most engaging experiences in the digital world, and in the meantime, how to attract people still to the physical retail space, to the physical world, and now to merge them, the two of them. This is also creating a competition without any boundary anymore. Well, in the past, you had your own brand, your product, and you are eventually designing your product and your brand against a specific competitor that was very well identified, the most of the time they're on shelf with you. Today, you are competing with essentially anybody. And if you consider on top of it also the speed of acceleration, the acceleration, the speed of uh, new products to market, there is a very high probability you are designing something without even knowing who you are competing with because those products and those brands eventually are not yet in market while you are crafting your product. The first implication to this is that you cannot create something good enough that somehow is beating your competitor. You need to focus on people, once again, and create the most extraordinary product, brand, service, solution for them, no matter what your competitor is doing. This is changing completely the competitive landscape. Then there is the world of social media. Essentially, think about what social media are for us. Essentially, you, in your you know, digital platform, uh, you surround yourself with people that, in a way or the other, share the same passion and experiences and dreams 
with you. It could be the peers of uh, your peers in uh, at work, your friends, or it could be you know what we call today influencers. By definition, these people filter information that are relevant to you and they amplify them endless times. And and this is changing completely the way. Uh, companies, big and small, build brands. When in the past, uh, a big corporation like PepsiCo will craft a message and impose it top down through the TV channel, mostly, and then there were other uh, channels that were somehow supporting that main communication. Today, we are not even the actors of the conversation anymore. anymore. We are not there saying something to somebody. We become the topic of a conversation happening among other people. We're moving from a world where we used to buy the right to talk to people to a world where we need to earn the right to be talked about. And so this is a phenomenal challenge because it means that 24 seven, you need to create products, experiences, and stories that are relevant to people. In a world that is moving at the speed of light, where this idea of relevance actually is changing day by day. Where a brand like Pepsi or Lay's or Gator, it is not competing anymore with other products in food and beverage, but it's competing for mind share, for attention, with a variety of other pieces of content, with the latest song of Beyonce or with the latest uh, cell phone of Samsung, as an example. So uh, the world of brand building is radically changing. Then there is this green back of digital enabled communication, entrepreneurship, manufacturing, and distribution. What that means is that anybody here today in this audience, any of us, today can come up with an idea, get relatively easy access to funding, think about sites like kickstarter.com, or think about the proliferation of VCs and funds in California, New York, but essentially all around the world, from Italy to Saudi, from the government to the private uh, banks and institutions, uh, there are all these entities hunting for new ideas. Today it's easier to get access to money than 20 years ago. Now you get the funding, the cost of tooling, the cost of manufacturing is going down, driven by new technologies. Technologies like 3D printing will take it even further down. And then you can go straight to people, consumers, through e-commerce, and you build your ecosystem of communication through social media. Once again, new technologies. Today I was reading the, the Financial Times uh, and about Verizon uh, testing the 5G in Minneapolis, in Chicago, and other local carriers in Korea. The 5G, 5G will amplify endless times the opportunity we have both to sell stuff and to communicate and build experiences around this. So a world that is changing dramatically, but essentially what all of this is creating is that anybody, any of us, once again, can go and compete with one of these big brands, these big corporations. The entry barrier that in the past these big companies had are essentially all down. And this is changing completely the way these companies are running uh, innovation. I, I will arrive to the extreme of saying that probably for the first time, they really seriously need to do innovation. For many years, you know, the innovation was the first product that was created that made the company, made the brand. But then in years, eventually, they were protecting that product, it was good enough in many cases, and then essentially incrementally adapting to the needs of the society of the market. And then the Uber of the world, the Airbnb of the world, arrive and disrupt in their case, the world of transportation, the world of hospitality. There are so many other examples in other, in other industries. Essentially, we know as a fact that sooner or later, the Uber or the Airbnb of the world will arrive to our category. We know. So we need to figure out, companies, big and small, how to innovate ourselves and how to create something that is extraordinary for people, for getting competition, because that's the only way today to succeed. And finally, this final bucket called Internet of Things. What that says is that essentially everything that surrounds us is becoming smarter and smarter and more connected. A bottle in the near future will have a, a label that will inform the consumer, the person that is using uh, the bottle uh, of the content when the content is finished, is expired, will talk directly with the refrigerator or with the smart home, reordering itself. When you put it on a table, the table will understand if the content is to be refrigerated 
or if, it, if it's something that you want to keep hot. And the table will also suggest pairing of food or eventually will intertrain your kids while you are in a restaurant and you are having uh, a dinner with friends. So essentially, everything that surrounds us, in a way or the other, will become smarter. And so what is the role of us, innovators, designers, entrepreneurs inside companies, uh, big and small, to figure out how this digital and technological revolution can be leveraged to innovate once again, again, focusing on people and creating something extraordinary for people. These are the challenges that we have today, and I think design plays a unique, unique role in building value for people that don't search just products anymore, and for a business world where all the, the vast majority of entry barriers are down, and therefore you need to create something extraordinary for the society and for human beings. A world where people don't just buy products anymore because they search solutions, first of all, to their needs and their wants and their dreams that are as holistic as possible. It's not just product driven. They search experiences, and experiences is a sort of gate to access that solution that are as meaningful as possible. So it's all about empathy and deeply understanding what, how to create something meaningful to people. And finally, they search stories that communicate that solution, that communicate that experience that are as authentic as possible. Every single word in this chart essentially is, is conveying, is talking also about one of the big challenges, many of the big challenges that we have in organizations, big and small, today to create something that makes sense for people. Now, once again, this is changing completely the way companies do innovation and the way companies do brand building. And this is where I think us as designers have a phenomenal opportunity to get in with our approach to problem solving, with our toolbox, with our ability to connect empathy, uh, the ability of understanding needs and wants of people, what is relevant to people, strategy, the ability of understanding what is relevant to your company from a process standpoint, from a business model standpoint, and from a culture standpoint. And then the ability to prototype. That means essentially the ability to craft, to create, and, and to use uh, our tools and our toolbox as a, to facilitate thinking, alignment, and co-creation within the organization. This is what design is about. Empathy, strategy, and prototyping. Call it design thinking, call it design, call it whatever you want to call it. The reality is that this is giving us the possibility to have a seat at the table and create value for these organizations, shifting the balance from marketing-dominated organizations uh, or tech are indeed dominated organizations to organizations that are embracing creativity and design and they're giving us the possibility to create together for our target audiences. Now, who is really benefiting of all of this anyway, at the end of the day, is us as human beings. If you don't do something extraordinary as a company, as a brand, for people, somebody else will do it for you on your behalf. There is millions of people we know, there are millions of people out there trying to understand how to take down the most of the brands are in the market today. Identifying the weakness, but the weakness is there usually the most of the time when you don't serve a specific need or want or people. And so, once again, there will be a proliferation of products, brands, and services that are extraordinary for us, for the society, for people. Because once again, if companies don't do it, somebody else will figure out a way to do it and will do it for us, for the society. And therefore, there is this new renaissance, this new focus on people. And designers, I think, are the professional community that is the most focused on people, on human beings. We get excited when we create something that you can put in the hands of people and, and, and that something is cool or is relevant, is useful, it makes sense. That's what excites us. There are other communities that are excited when they make money, when they create business value, when they grow a brand. Other communities that get excited when they file a patent and they do you know, an amazing technological innovation. We get excited when we put stuff in the hands of people and they get excited. We are the advocates of people inside these organizations. And while eventually they didn't need us 10 years ago, 20 years ago, today, because of this new focus on people, they need us more than ever. It's a fantastic opportunity we have. Now, to do that, we also need to understand how to play you know, our role, how to really create that kind of value. And it all starts, once again, with the people we serve.
So how to design, one of the biggest challenges challenge is how to design something that is relevant and meaningful to people, an experience that is relevant and meaningful to people. Well, every time you interact with any product and any brand, it could be a luxury uh, automotive brand, it could be a luxury fashion brand, or it could be a mass market brand. There are three steps of interaction, three benefits that you usually search and you find in most of the cases. The first one is the functional benefit. Essentially, I buy a drink because I wanna hydrate myself, I buy a car to move from A to B. The second one is what we call the emotional benefit. Essentially, I buy something, I buy a product because I really love that product, I really love the, you know, the, the feature of the product, the cashmere sweater, the feet, I buy a brand because I really love the brand. I really love that Apple iPhone. I really love that Harley Davidson. It's between you and the product and nobody else. You just love the brand or the product. The third benefit is what we call the semiotic benefit. Essentially, is what that product or the brand or both of them is saying about you to the rest of the world. My watch without hands that doesn't tell the time, brandless essentially, <laughs> is a product, is telling you a story about me. My jacket, my shoes, the car I drive, the friends I have, the books I read, anything that surround me and anything that surround you is telling a story to the rest of the world. Each of you, without saying a word right now, you are telling a story to all the people surrounding you. Unfortunately, I cannot see you, so you're not saying much to me, but usually when I see the audience, I read the faces, I read your body language, and it's interesting how we are 24 seven communicating the semiotic value of us and what surrounds us is there 24 seven. This is what we do as designers. We design the functional benefit, we design the emotional connection that people have with products and brands or both of them combined. And then we design the stories that those products and the, those brands are telling about people to the rest of the world. Now, this is pretty clear in the luxury industry, in the premium industry, you wear a specific brand because you are telling a specific story about your taste, about your economic status. But this is in reality true in essentially every industry. And there are so many examples of this. And the more we understand that that's the case in industries where this is not clear yet, the more we find opportunities. Now, we say that people don't just buy products, they want experiences. These experiences could be meaningful or no meaningful. We try to have them as meaningful as possible. How do you design something that is meaningful to people? Now, we could talk for hours about this, and there are many points of views and many ways to tell the story. This is one way of telling a story that has many faces. Essentially, is uh, every time you interact with products, brands, but also with other people and spaces, there are three levels of interaction. These are uh, my, um, is my free interpretation of the theories of Don Norman that many of you know. Uh, he, he personally, and I've, you know, I, I, I read his first book, Psychology of Everyday Things, when I was a kid at school, and then many years later, a couple of years ago, I had the pleasure to meet him, and he endorsed this approach that I'm sharing with you. Uh, somehow, this was inspired by this, by this latest book, and I think it, it was published in 2002, and it's called Emotional Design. Uh, in that book, no, uh, Don Norman talks about interaction with people and spaces and the first interaction you have when you see for instance a beautiful or interesting man or woman or a beautiful landscape uh, is what we call the visceral relation you know is the wow effect is the butterfly in the stomach is something that is beyond rationality you may love it actually you may hate it but it's something that when you see something boom you react to it it could be a special edition can uh, by 7up, and once again, we say it's solution. It's never just the product, it's experience, it's communication. So it's the entire ecosystem. Every time we design something, we try to build an ecosystem of stories, communication, partnership in licensing with fashion brands, uh, with consumer electronic brands, always trying to convey the kind of uh, meaningful story for the specific target audience that we have in front of us. It could be 
a new brand of water. This has been a very, very successful launch for us, uh, Life Water. Essentially, we took a bottle, you know, and think about the three values, functional, emotional, and semiotic. Life Water is a bottle where the, the bottle itself become a canvas for collaboration with artists. Every three months, we have a different collection. Uh, uh, essentially, we collaborate with different artists. So you continuously find new bottles on shelf when we go to buy, to buy them. Uh, the purpose of the brand is the one of creating the create, uh, sorry, the supporting the creative community, supporting especially emerging artists. That, that's the macro purpose of the brand. And then every collection uh, work on a specific cultural tension or uh, helping a minority, uh, trying to really uh, identify a specific cause that we want to support. Uh, we had a collection for women in art, we had a collection uh, for fashion designers, but the one that works on patterns and textures. So every time we try to have a specific um, cause, cause that we try to support. Now, again, you buy water because you want to hydrate yourself, functional benefit. Um, the emotional benefit is that surprise, that excitement that you find every time you are in front of the shelf and you find these new collections. And the, uh, and the fact that we keep creating new collections give us the possibility to keep that excitement high. And then the third value, the semiotic value, is both driven by the aesthetic of the bottle, you know, walk on the street with bottles that are becoming somehow a form of accessory, and as well as the connection with the purpose of the brand. That is a brand that is trying to good, do good in the society. It's not just product driven. These are some of the collections. This is the latest one that we launched, I think, last week. Uh, is not just the product, but is the entire ecosystem. From the selection of the curator, for it, from the celebrity one, like Paolo Antonelli, uh, from the Museum of Modern Art of New York, to Anna Winter, all the way to everything that happened in retail, in, in a variety of different platforms of activation, like Freeze, Milan Design Week, and so on and so forth, we try to build a consistent story across every, every touch point of the brand. Uh, these are some of the examples, uh, the, 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 the party we did, the Super Bowl for the launch of the, of the brand, together in partnership with Condé Nast and Vogue, uh, and um, a cooler that we designed with Studio Job in Europe. Once again, every time trying to create a consistent engagement with people, trying to recreate, to, to generate a visceral relation that I mentioned earlier. The second relation is what we call the interactive relation. So in the analogy of Don Norman, you go out with this woman, with this man, and you really love to stay with them. It's rational and it's emotional. It's in your head and it's your heart. Uh, you are in front of an amazing landscape. You are in front of the Grand Canyon. And it's just, you know, both your mind and your heart and your full body completely engage in that. It's that fine balance between rationality and emotion that define every experience. This is one of the first projects uh, we did when, when we created the design center of PepsiCo. Essentially, it's a font, a machine, uh, with a screen that is a sort of iPad where you select your drinks, could be a sparkling water, a tea, a Gatorade, or a cola, and then you add your flavors and you customize your drink. Thousands of different drinks. We have real-time data, uh, data is a trendy word today, on what the consumers, the people are creating that feed our innovation pipeline. And we also have the possibility to talk to people through the screen, telling you uh, what everybody in your college is creating, what is the trendy mix of the day, or having a celebrity communicating to you, or suggesting pairing of food with your drinks when you are in a restaurant. Extremely successful product, we generated a series of other products out of that. The, the challenge was always the same. How to create something that was really engaging, uh, you know, that, that would attract you from far away with a screen, and then when you get closer, it's really fun to use. But, and that's the emotional side. But then how to create something that was, first of all, user friendly. You're in front of the user interface. You need to figure out how to use it very quickly. And mostly, you need to move out of the way very quickly because you don't want to create a line. What is the right balance between engagement, emotional, emotionality, and then the functionality, the user friendliness, friendliness of the interface? A typical, typical design challenge for all of us working in this kind of products from industrial design to use UX and UI. But this is very important and what makes the success of the failure of projects. Uh, 
after creating a line of products that are in the market, we are always thinking about what's next, what is the future. This is an example of an experiment we did in uh, college uh, here in California and then a Super Bowl of equipment that eventually comes to you. You can order it through an app and then you get your food and your drinks directly wherever you are. This is another product um, uh, that is very close to my heart, talking about functionality and, and emotions. Essentially, one, two of the macro challenges that we have in our industries are sustainability and health and wellness. This is one of the products that we generated years ago to try to answer to that kind of challenge. It's called Dreamfinity, that's the name of the product and the brand. Essentially, it's a bottle uh, that you fill with tap water, reusable, so you don't have plastic, you just reuse your bottle. You use pla uh, water, so the carbon footprint is reduced to minimum. And then you have these pods with a, a liquid components, the flavor, and the dry component, usually something with a functional value, spirulina, turmeric, coffee, cinnamon, a variety of different ingredients. And so you put the pod on top of the bottle and you, sh you mix the three components and you have your uh, bottle uh, on the go with a fresh content on the go. Uh, we launched it in America in the United States a uh, few months ago and since few weeks is also available in Amazon. We really hope the consumers are gonna embrace more and more these kind of products because that will give us the possibility to step by step shift the entire portfolio in that direction. Uh, we just acquired SodaStream, we are all going in that direction. If us, society, people, consumer, embrace this kind of solution, we can accelerate it as much as possible. Now, we always think platform, if you mix Dreamfinity with the world of Gatorade and with the world of um, uh, the digital fountains that I showed you earlier, and then you add another ingredient that is wearable technologies, I, I did my thesis of wearable technologies, a topic that I really, really love. This is what come out in the world of Gatorade. I have a video that will tell you the story better than I can. Your game is our lab. Introducing the future of sports fuel. Gatorade GX, your real-time hydration coach. Gatorade GX tracks fluid loss before, during, and after training. Capturing every moment of sweat. Measuring electrolyte and sodium loss in real time. Fluid intake is continually monitored with on-the-fly guidance, showing you when to hydrate while pacing your intake. Analyzing your fluid balance, Gatorade GX unlocks your personal fuel strategy. Recommending fuel formulas based on your electrolyte and carbohydrate needs. Conveniently delivered through an innovative equipment system. Replacing what's been lost when you need it the most. Track, analyze, and optimize your performance. Gatorade GX, built to fuel, customized for you. And customization is one of the big trends we are investigating today. Customization for pro athletes, customization also in the world of sodas. This is another uh, experiment we ran in the Innovation Fair in New York, Super Bowl, Milan Design Week, and then it became a stable installation uh, in uh, Disney, in Shanghai, in Hershey Park, and it's all about the world of sodas and customization. What is Fizz? It's a whole new way to look at soda. This is not a drink, it's really an experience. I'm excited to introduce you to the world of Fizz. Fizz is a whole new way of looking at soft drink mixology, which we like to call Fizzology. They have these cool machines here called Pepsi Spires. They're already flowing now. What were you feeling? Batter up. Batter up. Then you take it over to these physiologists. These guys are taking the most unexpected flavors and creating the most imaginative drinks you can possibly imagine. Check it out. They're loving getting to interact with it, what goes into it that makes it, watch something be created, and then get to consume it. It was nice to see it made in front of your eyes. You got to do it and then eat what you made. I love it. Really innovative. Awesome. It was just cool to see it all come together. 
Watching them put all the coffee. A delicious drink. Being a great taste. I love it. I love the flavor. This is not just a drink, it's an experience. It's been a really exciting day so far. As you can see, we're going to blow it now. And it's always about playing with every, every element. It's the product itself, it's the vessel, uh, it's the physiologist, it's the uh, space, the environment, Willy Wonka style. Uh, and it's all about this idea of customization. It's all about this balance between the emotional value of indulgence in this case. But then these are drinks that are one third of the calories of a, a can of soda, just as an example. So he's always trying to find the right balance to create something that makes sense uh, for people and in the specific kind of context of use uh, and purchase. Uh, this is the fees uh, now called Bubbles in Shanghai and in Hershey Park. Uh, and we have a variety of different installations. More and more we're using platforms of communication to test, to try new ideas, uh, prototyping ideas, and then getting feedbacks from users, from consumers, and then uh, tweaking those ideas, killing the one that don't make sense, and the one that instead makes sense, scaling them up in a variety of different um, opportunities and business models. Uh, so we talk about visceral, interactive, the third uh, expression, the, the third relation is what we call the expressive relation. In the analogy of Norman, you go out with this man, with this woman, and you feel so good that you want to talk to everybody about them. You're back from your vacation in the Grand Canyon, you want to show the pictures of your vacation to everybody. Social media are the perfect platform for that. So it's that pride and a joy that connects you to that specific experience. Uh, it could be uh, a potato chips bag, uh, in this case is the Stacy's brand and the support for um, women during Women's Days, many years before Me Too, all the way to uh, the world of Pepsi. Uh, packaging that drives, they become content and become uh, even more powerful than traditional content thanks to social media, all the way to uh, a celebration of the brand that is not anymore just focused on the product itself, the cola, but on what the cola stands for. This is Soccer World Cup six years ago. We are not a sponsor of the event, uh, our friends from Atlanta are in this case, uh, but we do sponsor a variety of different athletes. So this is Messi, for instance, we took with Danny Clinch, this famous photographer, black and white pictures. We ask street artists from every country of, of the different soccer players to, in a live uh, performance in London, to paint over the uh, portrait, the photography. That became content itself. And then we took the art and we started to create a series of collaborations with a variety of different brands. Del Toro shoes, Penguin jackets, Bang & Olufsen, Bang & headphones, and a variety of other products. It's a model that worked out very well for us. And so we keep repeating it. This is UEFA Champions League, for instance, as a platform. But it's not applied just to soccer, it's applied to a variety of different um, situations, uh, collaborations with brands. This is one of the latest we did with Puma that has been extremely successful uh, for us. It, this is the new campaign for Pepsi Zero Sugar that we launched a few, few weeks ago around the world. And every time, once again, is connecting the product together with uh, an ecosystem of other products and experiences. This is what we did in Shanghai, what we keep doing in Shanghai, we are the main sponsor of Shanghai Fashion Week. It's also interesting to understand, to see, to witness how there is nothing local anymore. You can do something in, in Shanghai. Uh, earlier you, you saw the images of Cheetos in Brazil and the House of Cheetah. Uh, there are so many different activations that are local but become global content. Glocal is the keyword for all these corporations today. Now, the challenge that we have every time is how to uh, reach all these different uh, status, this different kind of relationship. Every time I talk about visceral, interactive, and expressive, everybody nods in the in the in the um, uh, in front of me because they are the way we connect with other people are natural to all of us. The challenge is how can I connect this to a value for the business? If I create the visceral effect, there is a very high probability that I'm going to create emotional inputs purchase. I go to a store with a list of things to buy, and then I get out with a cart full of things that I didn't expect to buy, but they really excite me when I was there in the store. The interactive one is 
emotional satisfaction and loyalty. It's the line of people out of an Apple store to buy the latest iPhone, even before they ever tried it, because there is just that emotional attachment and loyalty to the brand. The expressive one is communication and spontaneous PR, word of mouth. It's people becoming the ambassadors of your brand and communicating about them. The visceral one is purchase, interactive is repurchase, expressive is recommend. If we go back to the user perspective, and that is very relevant to us as creative, as designers, it's always about creating the wow effect in everything you do at every touch point. It's about creating an engagement that is rational and emotional, and it's about creating that sense of pride and joy that you have when you connect to a specific product and brand. This is what we need to do every time we design. Moving from the bottom of this pyramid all the way to the top, we still need to understand how to create utilitarian needs, how to work on usability, reliability, and functionality. In the world, for a brand like Pepsi, it's all about competing with another color. It's more or less calories, flavors, you know, it's, it's the functionality of the product. You go up to pleasure and convenience in the occasion of use. It's the pleasure and convenience of drinking a Pepsi versus anything else when I have a meal with my family or when I am walking to work, for instance. In that case, Pepsi competes with any other potential drink, from wine to energy drinks to juices to water. And then it's all about going up to the world of meanings and dreams. Well, what I like to call the brand space is where Pepsi starts to compete with Nike, with Apple, for, where a brand needs to stand for something in society in a variety of different ways. We need to work every time across the entire pyramid. All of this is applicable to the brands and products of today. And today, I share with you a variety of different examples for today, from today. But obviously, there are many examples of what, is gonna, what are going to be the products and the brands of the future that I cannot share with you for obvious reasons today. But this is a short video that tells you a little bit about how we're thinking uh, about the world of beverage, drinks, and, and snacking in the future. Imagine a world where breakfast isn't simply made to order. It's biometrically tailored to meet your body's very own unique needs. Where water isn't merely made clean, it's purified from the sky, harnessed at hydration hubs, and augmented with the nutrients you desire. Available around the world. Where fruits and vegetables aren't just locally grown, they're harvested within arm's reach. And transformed into on-the-go eats. Imagine a world where food is sustainably packaged from bio-based innovation and responsibly recycled in every city around the planet. Where a snack isn't just instant food, it's pure goodness on demand, fueling your afternoon and maximizing your goals where a table is smart enough to know exactly what you need and turns a night of music, drinks, and entertainment into an experience to remember. Imagine a world where the products we make bring joy to the planet and the people they are made for. And so this video touches many of the different challenges we are facing and opportunities from uh, farm to table, organic, all the way to mass customization, digitization, and so on and so forth. And we have hundreds and hundreds of projects that we're running around this different theme. Now, uh, I want to leave you with one of the ch many challenges that we are facing to build something like this inside an organization of the size 
uh, of PepsiCo. We started talking about people. We talk about people all the time. Uh, uh, you know, we design for people. It's this new uh, humanistic time. But it's not just the people that we design for that are important. It's also the people that are designing, the people that are driving innovation uh, in, inside this organization, big and small. And that's the, one of the biggest challenges that we have, how to find the best, the best talents to drive something like this. Because we often talk about processes, but the reality, you know, when we talk about design thinking, we read books about design, we always, always talk about processes. Processes are like, uh, they're like a brush. Put a brush in the hands of Picasso, put a brush in the hand of a kid, and the result will be very different. We need the right talents. What, are the, what is the list of characteristics we search in the talents we hire in the company? Well, first of all, we want good human beings, good people, people with a good soul. And it may sound like you know, something corny and nice, and you know, I have to say it. The reality is that it is so, so important to build the right dynamics and synergies inside the organization. You know, each of us wanna work with good people. You know, when you work with good people, you feel good. When you work with somebody that you know could stab you on the back, it's not okay. And so all of this impacts the productivity of your company. All of, the, all of this impacts the ability of your company to work with efficiency. Good human beings run productivity inside the organization is even if you don't if you don't do it for ethical and moral reasons do it for the productivity of your company good people before anything else then we need designers that understand design holistically they understand graphic they understand branding they understand industrial design they understand experience fashion architecture all digital all the different dimensions of design this is extremely important we are so you know we are training specific a vertical in a specific pillar, the more we want to impact and create uh, these companies and create value, the more we need to understand design holistically because these brands are on stage 24 seven and they need, and they need to convey a one uh, consistent, coherent story. We need people that are business savvy. Yes, we are creative. We need to protect our creativity, but we also need to be able to articulate the value of what we do in front of the business world to make sure that our ideas get to market and get in the hands of millions and millions of people and can create value, not just for the company that we work for, but for the world. We need people that are visionary, but also practical and understand the big picture, but know how to act on the day to day. We need people that if they were not inside the company, would be out there creating their own startup, entrepreneurs in their heart and in their mind. We need people with a very high EQ and empathy, people that are able to bring others with them. It's not you know, a one-man show, one community show. This is the age of collaboration and sharing. We need that kind of empathy in everything we do. We need people that are respectful. This is so, so, so damn important. You know, as design community, so many times we don't respect the business community. We are like, oh, we figure it out. They don't understand it. You know, we are an agency, we are creating something for a company. Oh, they butcher our product or our idea. But we have, we always know what to do. And the business community doesn't respect the design community. Oh, the creative people don't get it. They don't understand it. The reality is that when you respect somebody, you, you put yourself in a wonderful situation. When you respect somebody, you respect the business person in front of you, for instance, you, you can arrive to two potential different results. One is that you try to understand why the person is not understanding you. And maybe you will find out something that you are ignoring, that you didn't understand. Because often you have in front of you people that are not that stupid, you know, especially if they are executives in these big organizations, then most of them are not that stupid if they're there. So maybe they understand something we don't understand. If you do, you will better yourself. You understand their point of view, you will better yourself. In other situations, you will understand that eventually they are not understanding you. But then at that point, why? You, you wonder why, and you try to figure out why, and eventually you change your vocabulary, you change your access, you change your point of view to reach them. And once again, when you reach them, you will create something together that is better. So respect is at the base of everything good, not just in business, but also in society. Obviously, this is applied to any kind of a situation in our personal and life and in society. We need people that are risk takers, that are change agents by nature. It's not something spontaneous and natural to human beings, but we need that kind of characteristics. And then we need design thinkers. Uh, I, I, this is a list of characteristics of the design thinkers. I'm not gonna go through all of them in depth. Uh, you can find them if you have time to waste in a paper that I wrote years ago for the Design Management Institute review called Love Letter to Design. Essentially, once again, we, we need people that are 
are visionary and practical, that are elegant, simple, that, that find solutions that are simple and in perfect balance of all the different elements, both in the process as well as, as, well as in the output. They are polyglot and storyteller. You know, we live in, the, in this world where we need to connect with the world of finance, of technology, of consumer insights, with all the different disciplines, and we need to be able to tell, to talk different languages and be the connector, the catalyst, the glue of, of all these different uh, professional communities with a focus, once again, on people. We need people that are intuitive. Let's protect intuition against process. We need people that are dialectical, that understand, that feel comfortable in the gray areas, not you know, in your silos, but really connecting all the different silos together. And finally, people that are in love. We talk so much about customer satisfaction. You know, it's the mantra in many organizations. But think about the word satisfaction. When you want to satisfy somebody, you try to do everything is possible to fulfill a specific need. But if you love somebody, it could be your kids, your, your wife, your husband, your parents, you try to do more. You try to create something that is magic, that is surprising, that is totally unexpected. This is what drives the most of us, not just in, diverge, in the diverging phase, in the concept phase, but along the process, protecting the integrity of the love all the way to the product and the brand that reach people, consumers, the market. Be curious, love diversity, listen with humility. It's so easy when you start to be successful to stop listening and fall into the trap of your arrogance. But in the meantime, at a certain point, you need to stop listening and take action with confidence. One of the biggest problems of many organizations is this analysis paralysis and lack of action. Be resilient and optimistic. If you are changing things, you will always, always, always face roadblocks. It's part of the game, so you need to have the kind of mindset of looking at the glass always are full. Be always in quest, always hungry. Go the extra mile. If they ask you to do 100, always set for yourself 120, 130. Always challenge the brief that you receive from a client, from your boss, from yourself. Inside yourself, try to think, how can I think bigger? How can I do more than what they're expecting from me? It doesn't mean you will always succeed in doing that. But the few times in your life you will, you will be by yourself up there. And that, that is what it will make the difference in your life and in the life of the company you are for or your brand. Be aware, self-conscious, smile and have fun because at the end of the day, what we do should be fun. If we stop having fun, we should think about doing something else. This is the last slide and the last message I want to leave you with. I really believe that pe designers are people in love with people. I think you know, I share this through this presentation in a variety of different ways. Everything that surrounds us, everything, you know, my shoes, this space, these chairs, anything, anything is designed by somebody. As designers, we have the beautiful opportunity of touching the life of everybody every day through moments of fun, of convenience, of safety, uh, of pleasure, depending on what we are designing. All those moments are potentially fragments of a broader social happiness exclusively. If we are driven by uh, an approach that is positive, by a positive purpose, by a positive intent exclusively, if we are designing thinking about sustainability, at 360 degrees, sustainability from an ecological standpoint, sustainability from a visual standpoint, beauty, lack of pol visual pollution, sustainability from a social standpoint, respectful, so, so sustainability from an intellectual standpoint, accessible and user-friendly, sustainability from an emotional standpoint, engaging, exciting. If we are driven by creating something like this with that kind of purpose, if we are all united as creative community all around the world, across all the companies we work for, then we have the possibility and with that also the, the opportunity and the responsibility of creating a better world for us and mostly also for the generations to come. Thank you.